Hello, everyone. I had last time explained integration, and I think there were a few concepts that were probably not clear to you, at least not on an intuitive level, maybe on the mathematical level, because I think the definitions are formally quite easy to, uh, to grasp, but maybe not what this whole thing means. At least I got many questions in that direction, and I hence therefore want to just at the beginning give you an example or maybe a not even it's maybe more than an analogy it's it's just an example of what could be an n form or an n linear form so remember we are of course talking about manifolds and all the objects that we are introducing try to characterize something that has relevance on this manifold picture and the manifold um, as we saw many times, could be the Earth surface. Now we could have an example. The example, maybe now um, just the right example for um, starting winter, could be that you have the Earth surface and there is snow falling. And maybe you now want to characterize how much snow is there in any of the possible areas. So you have here the, the surface of Earth. And now you could ask if you go somewhere, let's say to Zurich, and you take a little cube and you just ask yourself how much snow is there. And then you may, of course, go somewhere else to the mountains and, and then there's a different value there. Now, of course, the how much snow falls is more or less continuous. So if you take a small enough cube, then you could say this is somehow a good measure for how much snow or the kind of the density of snow, if you want. But at the moment, we haven't introduced the notion of density. So what we did so far is somehow to think of cubes being somehow defined via parameters. That's what we would indeed do, I think, in practice. So in practice, we would say we have, of course, a coordinate system of the Earth. So we have a map. And now in this map, we, have, we can say, OK, let's define a cube on this map. Now a cube. What I call a cube in, on a two-dimensional manifold is, of course, just essentially a square. So, I mean, it is a square on the, on the coordinates. And we know, of course, because the Earth's surface is curved, that this is not a perfect square on the Earth's surface. It's something kind of with curved side, um, curved borders and so on. But in coordinates, it's a perfect square. So we could say we somehow define a function which tells us at any point how much snow there is and what we provide as input to the function is kind of the geometrical shape. So we, for example, say now I want to know how much snow is in this particular square here. So what's this square? So this square is essentially defined by a certain value in which I go in this direction. Let's call it lambda yeah, let's assume it's really a square, so it's, it's lambda in both directions. And of course, on the manifold, as you know very well, the direction vectors corresponding to this side are denoted by d to the dx1 and d to the dx2, for example. Now, in this particular case, if you want to characterize the snow everywhere, you would say you define a form, a two form which takes as input, as I said, the geometric shape. But this shape should be something that is, um, is spanned by vectors. So it's something like a cube. It doesn't have to be a rectangular angle. It could be something else. But something that you characterize by the vector in this direction here and by the, the vector in this direction. Here is just the coordinate lines. Could be something more general. So you input into this function, which is of course now a form, the vectors e to the dx2, and actually you should put a lambda in front of them because I said um, that you have the square of a particular size in coordinate um, measured in terms of coordinates. So this lambda has nothing to do with the real length or, or it's not a meter or something, it's just in the coordinates some value. Now it's this quantity that, that now has an interpretation, of course, for any choice of these little um, objects here. And 
so the, the significance of the quantity in this example is just how much is there of this thing that you're interested in this case the snow in this particular shape and of course the same we can now do in three-dimensional space we could for example now in physics um, the charge let's say of an object and just say let's take a three-dimensional cube and now we have an object which is again a form which tells us at any place in the in space if we put in this shape how much charge is in this particular shape so therefore a form has to take an input which is the input that defines the shape by the way i could have defined it of course independently of a coordinate system i just did that because we thought in these in this particular way about cubes i could now just say this is some vector v1 and this is a vector v2 which defines the cube but the cube is really only a cube in coordinates that's why i prefer to think in this way okay so that's what we so that's maybe a good example to keep in mind because it also makes clear that so far this whole notion has nothing to do with a metric we didn't need kind of a an object to measure lengths. So remember that we introduced the notion of a metric much later than when we introduced, for example, the differentiable manifold as an object itself. And this thing here, the tan and tangent spaces and so were introduced long before we had a metric. This thing can be defined and has an operational meaning or a geometric meaning or a meaning in terms of snow in this particular example, independently of a metric. That's an important comment because it will link to something we will do a bit later today okay so that was just a little repetition in some sense and maybe an example and another part of the repetition and then i will continue is that we showed something we had a proof and this proof was if we now take a cube like the one we had and now let's suppose we we have now general vectors so as i said before we can replace the vectors by any vector so it's a cube defined in this particular way and now integrate over such a form then this is approximately for a small cube equal to just the answer that this form gives if we ask it the question and the question is of course again like above we give it the geometry so in in a sense it's just two different ways of expressing the same thing as long as we are looking at small geometric shapes so if we are looking at small cubes then this thing just is giving us the answer as i said how much snow is in the cube this thing as well so you should understand the integration over an object as telling you as an answer the answer is a scalar by the way just a number how much of the stuff the snow is in this shape here now this holds approximately the left hand side can of course be generalized the left hand side is now true for any shape so you can now instead of a cube take the whole manifold the whole earth surface and integrate over that and you get all the snow on the earth surface together Okay, that's what we did. Are there questions so far or questions about what we did last time? Okay, if this is not the case, then let's remember what we tried to do. We said that we want something, namely we want to define a differential which has the following property. The property is also called Stokes' theorem. We want that if we integrate um, over the border of an area, U, if we integrate the form omega, then this should be the same as if we integrated over the whole volume, but we integrated a different object, which is the object we want to define, the D omega. Now, um, just to be concrete, this could be let's say if we are in a d-dimensional manifold so let's suppose u is d-dimensional and u could be a part of a manifold the region in the manifold then of course 
the boundary of the manifold is d minus one dimensional. So if we integrate over the dimension over the boundary, we can only integrate over something that over a form over d minus one form. Here, when we integrate over the whole manifold, which is d-dimensional, we have to have a d-form. So the d the omega has to be a d-form. So that was our requirement. I called that a desideratum. And this requirement could, in principle, be turned into a definition. Let me show you how. So I could say, OK, if I want to have that, I could do the following. Let's look at this differential and let's just try to see what it should tell us or what it should give us as an answer if we input d vectors. And of course, if we define a tensor, the way to define it is always to tell or to define or to specify what the answer is for any possible input. And the d form takes d vectors as input. Now, because a d form is linear, we could equally well write it in the following way, we could rescale everything by a lambda and even let the lambda be arbitrarily small and say that's really the same as one over lambda to, okay, instead of d, this should be an n, one over lambda to the d, and then all the vectors scaled by the factor lambda. So this is obviously the same thing because I can just take the lambda again out and it cancels with the prefactor. But the advantage or the reason why I do that is that now I can use what we proved last time, namely this relation. Because remember, it's true for a small cube. And the mathematically precise statement that is that in the limit where the cube is arbitrarily small, in this sense here, where we take the limit of lambda, the vectors, this equality holds precisely. So we could therefore say what that means, what we wrote here, is just that we have the limus of lambda going to zero, and I leave the prefactor. Then I've, I confused the n and the d. The reason is that I have n in my notes, but I want to do it with the d. So that's what, what this thing here tells us. Just copy that or apply that. And now I have to specify, of course, that the integration is over the cube that we defined. Now, finally, and the reason why I put it into this form of an integral is because I want to apply this desired criteria. So we want this to hold. So let's now see what happens if we require that. I still have the limits for lambda going to zero. And then I have the prefactor. And now I replace this integral by an integral over omega, excuse me, it's the integral of omega over the boundary of the cube. And the cube is still the same, lambda v1 until lambda vd. Okay, now we have an equality which only involves objects we already know. Because we could say this new object we want to define is given by this object, we already know what an integration is. Of course, we, we can also take a, a prefactor and we can take a limus here. So this we can, in principle, evaluate to determine that. And indeed, that's a valid definition of this differential. I and mean, it's called a differential or exterior derivative d of omega. This definition is, however, not very convenient to work with. And that's why usually people define that differently. And um, this definition that I will show you now is a more algebraic definition. So instead of explicitly telling what that is, what d omega applied to certain vectors is, we just specify it by giving certain algebraic properties. We just require that it has certain properties. So which properties should it have? Let's still for the moment look at that definition. So this definition is a definition that, of course, allows us to take the exterior derivative of everything we want of any form. And so we could, in particular, take the exterior derivative of the exterior derivative of a form. So what would that be? So if the form is d, a d minus 1 form, then, of course, 
the D omega is a D form as we said before. And the whole thing, the new thing that I just wrote here is now a D plus one form. Let's try to see what, what that could be. So, okay, let's just do it in an, for an example, because we will anyway at the end um, work with a more general definition, but for this is just for illustration. We want to understand what this should be. So let's suppose D is equal to two, which would mean that um, the D plus one form, the orange thing, the whole thing is a three form. I'm just for, um, let's say, illustration purposes, that's certainly useful because at least I can somehow indicate what a three-dimensional object is. So what should, would that mean? Let's just apply that definition. So the definition tells me that I should look at the small cube. So let's um, take the Lemus lambda going to zero and then take a prefactor which involves the form, the form is now a D, I mean, the degree of the form is a D plus one. So I have to multiply with Lambda to the D plus one. And then I take the integral of whatever was behind the first exterior derivative, which is still, of course, an exterior, exterior derivative. But I have to integrate over the boundary of the cube, which is now a cube which has dimension, um, yeah, in our example, it would be three, but let me here still write the general expression. So D plus one, but let me illustrate this. So we have cube. Okay. Now that's, as I said, for the case where D is equal to two. Now the boundary of the cube, what's that? So the boundary of the cube are of course these sides of the cube. There are six of them, I will not indicate all of them. So we integrate over this area that I tried to shade in some, so these are the six surfaces and now we still have to have this differential inside. So we, we have to evaluate that one. What does this, how can we do that? So we again apply this thing now with a separate, with another lambda. So I had already used the lambda. So I will use some lambda prime going to zero. And now I have two prefactors, one over lambda d plus one and the second one, one over lambda prime to the d. And now I still, have to write here something. So let me continue here on the next line. Now there is an integration and the integration. Okay. I think the key is now to understand what this integration um, means. So the first integral is an integral which goes over the surface of the cube, as I said. So we take at any point of the surface. So let's, for example, look at the surface here, the one in front, that's one of the surfaces over which the integration has to run. And now we take little points on this surface. So let's suppose this is a point on the surface. So we, we integrate over all these points and at any of these points, we now have to do a second integration. So we do an integration again, that's the integration that comes from the second derivative, which is around a little cube. It's the boundary of a cube in that plane. But, but what is a cube in the plane? A cube in the plane is essentially a square. So now I'm one dimension lower. I'm now just in this plane and I draw, drew now a cube in the plane. So let me just here indicate the integrals with a color. So the, the first integral is over this violet thing, whereas the second integral is, it's actually over the, yeah, it's over the violet thing. And the, the second integral is over the green thing. And it's actually really the boundary of the green thing, which is, which are these four sides of the 
green thing. So I integrate over these little things, but I do that at any point of the surface. So there's another integral here, which where I have to put again a little square and so on. I will also at some point integrate over the top surface here. And then I will put a little square in this direction and so on. And then um, as I integrate over the violet surface, I will have to do another integral within that integral over the green one. So the point is I, I have the first integral over the violet points and at every point I integrate over the green thing. Now, if you look at this, of course, I will at the end have covered the whole surface with little cubes again from the inner integral. And now it's important that you remember that a boundary always has an orientation and the orientation determines the sign. And the way you should think of the orientation in the case of a two dimensional integral is that the boundary is one dimensional, the boundary has a direction. So for example, I could say I, I do it counterclockwise if I look from the outside. So the integration goes in this direction here, as I indicate in this figure. Now, obviously, because you integrate all of those neighboring boundaries, like this one and this one, or for example, these two will just cancel. And because the surface of the three dimensional cube is essentially a closed thing that doesn't have a, a kind of remaining boundary, all the green integrals will at the end cancel. So I will integrate over omega over the green part, but this whole thing will cancel and I'll get zero. And that is a remarkable result because it tells us if we take twice the exterior derivative, we always should get zero. Of, of course, I illustrated that now just in a three dimensional picture, but I hope you can easily see that this is not really dimension dependent. You could somehow do the same reasoning in any dimension. Anyway, all that was just to give you a motivation for another definition that is usually given for the exterior derivative. And here, as I said, we start from these properties. So we say an, an exterior derivative is the following. It's first of all a linear map from d minus one forms to d forms. That's obviously what it is. Um, I mean, we, we already started with that assumption when we wrote these integrals here and so on. Such that, now come the properties. So what are the properties we would require? So the first property is something we could also verify. I will not do it now in the geometric picture because it's here just part of the definition. But it turns out that if you look at this geometric picture, and you take the wedge product, the exterior product of two forms. So you have, for example, two one forms, which kind of measure lengths of one dimensional things. And you take the exterior product. This gives you a form of a two dimensional things. It, it measures area, so to speak. And now if you take the exterior derivative of that, then it turns out that it has to follow a rule that looks a bit like the, I think it's called the Leibniz rule from taking derivatives or the product rule. So I think you, um, you, you are very familiar with such rules, except for a sign. There's a two minus one to the n, and the n depends on what form this is. So if the omega is an n form, then this is the relevant n. The, the degree of the other form is not relevant. If the theta, you get that. Okay, that's one of the properties. So the second property is the one we just derived. It's, I mean, derived, now it's a definition, but it's the one that we saw would hold if we took the geometric definition that I gave you before. And then we have a third requirement, which is that if I take the derivative of a zero form, then this should just correspond to taking a derivative of the function, you know, a zero form is just a function in the direction x, where x is an arbitrary vector. 
So you see, this is a one form, and I can define a one form by telling what it does if I input the vector. And now I'm telling you that, namely I say, take the vector and take the derivative of the function along that vector. And that's the answer that this one form should give you whenever you feed it with a vector. Okay, I think that that's already the definition. Now, um, I think the way I, I proceeded here was kind of coming from two sides because we could now, starting from that definition, again, derive the thing that we had as a desideratum at the beginning. So if you start from the algebraic definition, the statement of before is just a theorem. And the theorem is of course, I mean, I just write this again, is exactly what we had before, u d omega. And the proof, by the way, of this theorem, um, I don't want to present here, that's in the lecture notes. Okay, so just to make sure you understand the logic of this whole introduction. So what I gave you two alternative definitions of the exterior derivative. The one definition was the one that was really motivated by the requirement that we want the Stokes theorem to hold. So this was essentially put in as a, as a starting point, as a postulate, and then we said, this thing here that we wrote here, or in particular this lemus here, to integrate over the boundary allows us to define this exterior derivative. And using that definition, we found that certain properties hold, for example, this property here, that the, taking the exterior derivative twice gives zero. We could also, with this geometric definition, have verified this property. I was not doing that, but if we had enough time, we could do it, or this property. That's actually quite easy to verify. Maybe it's something you could try um, if you like. And then, however, I said that the usual way to proceed is the opposite. We just postulate all these properties and then show that the thing that we actually wanted to hold holds. And of course, in mathematics, you always have this choice. You can take one or the other thing as a definition and then there is usually a theorem which says that the two are equivalent. So you could in some way understand Stokes theorem as a part of this proof that the two definitions are equivalent. It's of course not the full proof because it would also show that this holds and so on. Any questions so far? Okay, this does not seem to be the case. Um, Let's say before we proceed now by reintroducing the metric, as I said, so far we have not talked about the metric and therefore also not about something like a volume really and so on. Let me briefly make a few comments about how these forms, the N forms look like in coordinates. So that's just a very little chapter, but it's important because in order to do calculations, you of course want to move to coordinates. So let's first just study the one form. So, or yeah, I mean the one form df. Of course, f is a zero form, but df is then a one form. So how can I express df in coordinates? Now, remember df was just defined exactly in, the, in a way we already understand. So it's x of f. So remember, how do you actually determine the coordinates of a form? So if I give you, maybe that's just a small, um, it's an interlude. If I give you an arbitrary form, omega, what's the coordinate omega, for example, i? Let's suppose it's a one form, then omega i would be given by applying omega to the basis vector d to the dx i. So we could do the same here now. I mean, we, we just say we want to understand what is d f i, what's the i's coordinate of f, of d f. So what we do is just we take d f i and apply it to a basis vector d to the dx i. Now, what does this give? Now we can look at the properties and you know we have the properties just stated here. We know what it means to apply df to a vector x. 
So we can just insert that. It means we apply the vector, which is in this case d to the dxi on the function, on, on the thing that was there before I took the, the derivative. And of course, that's the same as d to the dxi of f. That's just a different notation. So we have already determined the component of this one form that is obtained by taking the exterior derivative of a zero form. By the way, this of course means that if I now want to write df in terms of a basis, so what's the base, what are the basis elements of, of forms? It's of course the same as the basis elements of tens of zero one tensors. So it's this. So in other words, df has the form df to the dxi times dxi. Remember, a priori, this dxi was a different thing. So we defined this long before we introduced the exterior derivative. It's just a dual of the um, of this basis e to the dxi. But now we see that this this definition, this notation to use d both for the dual basis and for the exterior derivative makes sense because if you now insert for f xi, which is also a function, what is why is xi a function? Xi is just a function that tells you what's the i's coordinate at that point on the manifold. So I could put I could set f to be equal to dxi, or let's say dxj because i is my summation index. Then what I would get here is the derivative of dxj to the dxi, which is just a delta function. So I just get again dxj. So the two things are different. Are, are equivalent despite the fact that this d and this d are actually very different d's. So maybe you should really note that this d is the d of the exterior derivative and this object is the dual element of the basis. Okay. I think so far that was not too difficult. Now it will also not get much more difficult, but what we want to understand still is how do we deal with a K form? So let's suppose we have now an, a, an arbitrary form. Um, let's call it big omega. And now we want to understand what is big omega, what is D of big omega in terms of coordinates. It's useful to actually first write omega in terms of coordinates. And that's something we already did. So remember in the last lesson, two days ago, I said that we can write it as a summation over indices of that are and um, have increasing order. So I1 is smaller than I is strictly smaller than I2, and so on, up to IK. And then the basis elements dxi1, exterior product until dxik. I think there was, I saw at the end of the last, or the, of the Tuesday lecture that there was a lot of discussion in the chat about normalization factors. And I think some of you thought that there was, was maybe a, an error there. I verified it. And I think in the last lecture, the normalization factors were actually correct. But maybe it's confusing because what I did last time was to write two expressions, the one that I just wrote and another one, which is the following, omega i1 until ik and then dx i1 up to dx ik. And here I need a normalization factor of a factor of one over k factorial. And the reason is that of course, I have many more terms here. Here, this is the Einstein summation convention. So I don't only take terms in which I1 and I2 are in order in, in increasing order. I take any possible permutation. And how many permutations are there? They're of course, K factorial. So I need this prefactor here to make these two expressions equal. Okay, that was just a, um, to, for you to remember what we already had. And this is, of course, now the starting point. So if you want to have, if you want to understand the components of d omega, we have to expect that these components somehow depend on the components of omega. So it's only useful to write this 
Now remember we had another property last time for the exterior derivative. And this property said that if we multiply a function with a, with a form, then is, this is the same as the exterior um, product between the function and the form. And this means the following, that if you look at this expression here, then the first factor, omega, is actually a function. It's the coefficient function. It tells you at any point in the manifold what is the coefficient there. So it's a function. And this function is multiplied with a form, namely this thing here, which is a k form. It's, it's a k form built out of basis vectors, of dual basis vectors. So now what I told you means that I can just put here also an exterior product and interpret the function as a zero form. And now I take the exterior product between the zero form and the K form that is um, behind it. Okay. And that was a small step, but it's useful because once we have done that, we can apply the rule that we just um, set out with, which is this one here which is the rule that tells us how does the exterior derivative act on products of exterior, on exterior products. And now we have turned this into an exterior product. So it's useful for our purposes. So let's now finally do what we want to do, namely to write the omega in terms of components. Now, the way I do it is I first of all, just take the expression we have above, but put the D in front of it. And of course I can take the prefactor out. So I put the D here and then the D acts on everything else. So I omega I1 to IK and then wedge DX I1 and so on until DX IK. So it acts on all of that, but actually I want to now apply the product rule the rule two of or the rule one of before, seeing only this as a factor and this one, and not go into the details of that thing here. So what does this tell us? I just copy the rule. So the first thing is, by the way, a zero form, which means that we don't have to worry about the sign here. The sign is just one or it's plus. So what we get is we still have the prefactor, one over k factorial. And then what we have to do is just to apply the d only on this function, i1 until ik. And so to make sure it's really only applied to that function, I put brackets around it. And then we still have the remaining term, dx i1 and so on until dx ik, which is not affected by the exterior product. And now I have a second term, which still has, of course, the prefactor. And then omega is just left as it is, coefficient omega. But I apply the d to the rest. So now I make a, um, yeah, here I don't, don't think I need a bracket. I may need a bracket here, dx i1 and so on until dx i k. I don't have enough space here, so let me move this a bit. Now it should fit. So the last term is dxik. Now, of course, I can use, I mean, in principle, I could use again the product rule to now apply the d onto each individual of those, but I will not write this down because it's obvious that I will later also be able to apply the rule here which says that if I apply D twice, I will just get zero. So this whole thing here is just equal to zero, which is of course nice because it simplifies my expression enormously. What I'm left with is still having the prefactor one over K. Now D is applied to a function, but we already studied what it means to apply D onto a function in coordinates. That's exactly what we did here. So we can use that expression. So this expression tells me I just need to take the function, which is in this case, the whole expression with the coordinates and take the derivative to, um, I, yeah, what, yeah, I need a new summation variable, let's call it J, 
And you know, I had introduced this notation that the comma just means that I take the derivative with respect to dxj. That's the same as d to the d omega and everything to the dxj. And then I still have everything behind. Oh, sorry. And now, of course, I should also put the dxj. That's now, if you look here, I use that thing. And now comes the whole rest. So there's still the dxi1 and so on until dxik. But now I have a fully satisfactory expression because you see, this is just a basis vector again. It's just composed of dx chain. So it's a part of the dual basis of k plus one forms. This is obviously a k plus one form. because We have k components here and one here. And here we have a coefficient. So we know that the coefficient of the exterior derivative of a form is given by just taking the derivatives of the coefficients with appropriate prefactors and taking the appropriate basis elements here. Okay, I think that's essentially all that I want to say about general forms. Now we look at the very particular form and this will be essentially a new little chapter or section, which is the volume form on a Riemannian manifold. Or, I mean, okay, Riemannian now means it has a metric. And by Riemannian, let me just include also, of course, pseudo Riemannian, which is space time, where the metric is not Riemannian, but Lorentzian. And that should all be included in that chapter. So remember what I told you at the beginning. At the beginning, I told you if you have a question like how much snow is in this particular square defined by the coordinates then the form, a form can give you an answer. A form is the right mathematical object to capture this, um, let's say, device that gives you an answer. So the form is actually the device that you feed with this input, with the square, with the description of this little square, and it provides you an answer. Now the answer it provided to you was an answer about, in this example, about how much snow is there. Now you could ask a, a very different question, which is even more natural. I could just say, if I have a particular cube here on my atlas or my, on my chart, how large is this area actually in the real world? So it's again a form in, that, in, in the very same sense. So the input to the form is somehow a specification of a geometric structure, of a square in this case. And the answer I expect to have is a number, the area. And the area is now meant to be the real area in the real world, not the area in the chart, that would be easy to calculate, it's just lambda squared. So that's a well-defined, um, let's say, device now again. So again, it's a device that um, gets as input struct, a geometric structure and answers how large it is, how much volume or area is in that. And that's what we want to define next. So maybe just before the break, let me, um, maybe give you a possible answer. So again, um, what we want, so what we want is the following. We want to have something like a, a form. We, we will call it omega g because this will depend on the metric. You know, if I, if I somehow am interested in how large is something in the real world, then the metric will start to play a role. So we want a form omega g, which tells us the volume of a given, um, let's say set or domain, let's call it domain. It's just some, some domain in the manifold and I want to know the volume of that. Now, by the way, I, we can use the same thing as before. So I said, remember at the beginning that an integral is essentially the generalization of that answer. So what it mean, what this means is that what in, formally that if we integrate over this domain and we now integrate this form that we are looking for, then it should give us the volume of the domain. 
So that's now more formally stated what we would like to have. Yeah, I think this is maybe a good point to stop for a moment and um, to take a little break. So let's continue again at one o'clock. And at one o'clock, I will then um, tell you how this form has to de be defined such that it satisfies this requirement that we want it to have. Okay, are there any questions you would like me to address during the break? Jan, was there anything in the chat that I should be aware of? Uh, no. No? Okay, good. So. I mean, if there are no questions for the moment, and there was a question asked by email, maybe I could answer that one. Um, this question had to do with something that we did before, and maybe let me briefly use the time to answer that question. So the question was, it had nothing to do with what we are doing now. It was essentially the question about the postulate we made. And remember, the, one of the postulates we made was the postulate that the metric is a, or that the, par that the parallel transport is an isometry which is equivalent to say that um, the covariant derivative of the metric is zero. So remember we had this thing here as a requirement of a Levi-Civita connection. So actually we had two requirements for the Levi-Civita connection. One requirement was that the torsion is zero and the other one was that this thing holds. And the question was, what is really the motivation to make this assumption? Why do we require um, or why do we equip space-time with a metric that has this property? Or maybe conversely, why do we look at parallel transport in such a way that the metric satisfies this property? So this property, by the way, is equivalent to say that if I take the parallel transport along a curve, okay, let me not even, yeah. okay, let's put it like that, the, the parallel transport, along curve from some initial point, let's say at zero to S. So let's suppose the initial point I'm interested in is at zero and I transport it towards S and I apply this to the metric. Um, then um, the metric should still be the same. Um, I mean, I think I was asked this question several times and um, it's really a good question because it's a question that is a question about what, how are the postulates of, of relativity theory even motivated? Now let me maybe draw a little sketch. So let's suppose we have such a curve gamma, and of course this curve gamma can, can be arbitrary. And we have some point here, let's suppose it's point P, and we have another point here, Q. Now the metric tensor is defined everywhere in principle. So we can say that if you are at point Q, we can evaluate the metric and the metric here is called GQ or let me call it GQ and here the metric is GP. Now what the statement here means is that if I transport the metric from one to the other, it doesn't change. So let me maybe write this in a bit more detail. And one way, yeah, maybe it's actually useful just for convenience to say that the curve here is parameterized in such a way, I think I already used that, that this is gamma zero and this is gamma one, gamma, let's say S. And actually this tau means that I transport something from zero to S, it always goes from right to left. I could also do it the other way around. Actually, this is more useful given the picture. I could also transport something from S back to zero, if I like. Now, what can I transport from gamma s to zero? Of course, that's the metric at the point, and let me emphasize that, that's really at a different point, that's the metric at the point Q gets mapped to the, to the point P, and we are now 
looking whether it's the same. So in other words, the picture you may want to have in mind is that what this, this thing does, the parallel transport, it takes this object and transports it back here. And then we get a new object, which is called tau, or okay, maybe I just indicated with colors. Let's say the new object that we get is, um, what's a nice color, for example, okay, I think I already used most colors. Let's take this blue here. So this whole thing is of course something at point P and that would be the met let's call it, it's a metric at point P, but that's the metric defined by the parallel transport. So that's G tilde. And the requirement is that this G tilde at the point P, the one that we obtained by not just directly evaluating the metric, we, we went somewhere else to the point Q and pulled this metric back by parallel transport to the point P. And now we are comparing it with that thing. It's not so obvious what that means. Now, I think it's much easier if you think of vectors being transported. So instead of pulling this metric force and back, let's just look at vectors. So let me erase this again for a moment and say, let's suppose we have two vectors. Two because you know the metric takes two vectors as an input. So let's draw here two vectors. Let's say a vector x at the point P and another vector y at point p. And now one thing you should remember is the following, that if I transport the metric back, so I take the metric at the point q and transport it back to p, and now take this new metric, which I before called um, g tilde p, and apply this metric, now I can apply to the vectors, I apply them now to xp and yp, then this is by definition equivalent to say that I actually instead move the vectors to the point Q and evaluate the metric that was there. So I could equivalently now say I move the vectors, so I have to move them in the opposite direction. So I have to move them from zero to S, meaning from point P to point Q. I do that with the vector XP and I do the same thing with the vector YP. So these are now the transported vectors. And we could also indicate them with a color. So these would be red vectors. They're the transported ones. Let's call them XQ and YQ. So that's now XQ and YQ. Now, if the requirement, remember the requirement is that this thing should, or this metric should be the same as the metric G in the first place. So what we what this means is that the requirement, so let's say that this equality is really the requirement that the two metrics are the same. The requirement can now be written as saying this should still be the same as if I evaluated the metric on the directly on the vectors xp and yp um, at the point P. So in other words, um, one way, what I showed now is that instead of saying that we are um, compare, that we are evaluating this expression here, we could equivalently say we are testing the following thing. We take two vectors. Now we transport these two vectors to a point Q and apply the metric to it at the point Q. Then the value that we should get should be the same as if we just applied the metric here at point P. So I could now do essentially an experiment or, I mean, it's not really an experiment, but let me just phrase it in terms of something I could do. So let's suppose I take a meter stick. So let's suppose this is a meter stick. And of course I could even look at the special case where X and Y are equal. So this, so G of XP, YP is now um, just the length of this meter stick. So this expression is the length of the meter stick. Now this expression here is the length of the meter stick 
once I transported it to the point Q. So the equality here just tells me that the meter stick should be equally long independently of whether I measure it here or somewhere else. So if I take my meter stick and walk, walk to another place, it should, should still be a meter stick. That's essentially what this equality tells me. And if I look at it more generally, if I have, for example, um, um, two vectors, so for example, two gyroscopes, which are orthogonal, and if I take these two gyroscopes and they, of course, always keep the same direction, then, I mean, same direction with respect to each other, certainly, then, um, if I arrived at a different place, I still want them to be orthogonal. That's what I could at least try to verify. I mean, that's verified by just saying that gyroscopes that are orthogonal stay always orthogonal. They don't change their mutual direction. So in other words, the requirement that um, formally looks like this is really equivalent to the physical statement that meter sticks should always stay equally long if I transport them to another place. This has nothing to do with length contraction and so on. It's really just, I take them and put them somewhere else in space time. And then if I, I measure their lengths in their, and if you want in their own rest frame, so to speak, to, to have a well-defined meter stick, then it should still be the same. And I think that's um, a very good motivation. Of course, at the end, everything is verified by experiments, but that is the motivation to say, maybe it's a good assumption to say that apart from this torsion freeness, we also assume that the metric has this property, that things are equally long independently of where I measure them. Okay, let me restart. We had, um, just before the break, said that we want to define a, a form, a D form for a D-dimensional manifold, which has the property that if we integrate over the form, then we should get the volume of that in real space. Now this obviously has to do something with the metric. And one way to understand it is to go into normal coordinates. So let's just for the moment think about that. So remember normal coordinates are coordinates in which the metric is just essentially diagonal. And um, in addition, we want it actually the metric tends to be equal to eta. So it has one minus one minus one minus one, which has which means that if we look at a coordinate system, then if we have a coordinate x1, let's say equal to one, for example, this really means that this corresponds to one unit in real space. So the, that's what, what that's what normal coordinates do. So maybe one way to indicate this here is that if I look at this segment here in real space, then g of that, so let's say that this is now a vector v, then g of this vector, the square root of it, is equal to 1. Maybe I'll better write it as either plus or minus one, depending on um, whether it's a spatial or a time component. Now, obviously, if we look at the cube in this case, then the cube, if it has it, the volume of the cube in the coordinates, should now really correspond to the real volume. So that's a property that normal coordinates should have, because just the side lengths have the correct lengths, then the same must be true for the whole volume. So therefore, we would expect the following to be true. We would expect that if we put into this desired form just the side of the cube, so just these um, um, vectors, so let's suppose it's a d-dimensional cube and I just put the coordinate vectors d to the dx1 up to d to the dx d, then this should give me one. It's just a unit cube and the unit cube has volume one. In other words, in these coordinates, omega g should look like just this. Why do I know this? I mean, that's just exactly 
the tensor or the form which gives me one if I input this thing here. So if I input d1 or these vectors, they of course all give me exactly a one. In this order, of course, I have, I mean, in, remember this means I have all alternating orders, but all the alternating orders or all the other orders will give me zero because they're, these things will not match. So I get exactly one if I apply this form defined by this exterior product between all the basis vectors to these d basis vectors here. So that's what we would expect to have. Now, obviously, this cannot be true in general, because, you know, if, if you go to another coordinate system, which is no longer a normal coordinate system, then the coordinate length one here may mean that in re real world, it's just um, half as long or, or, or twice as long or so. So there has to be a prefactor here in general. And the question is, what is this prefactor here that we have to put? So it's clear that this alone, so without the prefactor, if the prefactor is one, cannot be a valid definition of a tensor. Of course, it's a valid definition if I say it's a definition that is only applicable to normal coordinates. But for general coordinates, this is no longer a valid definition. Now, what, would one, what could one expect to be there in general? If you think about it, it has to be an object which, for example, scales like um, or let's suppose I rescale all the coordinates by the same lambda. So I go to a new coordinate system in which everything is squeezed by lambda. Then obviously the volume has to be squeezed by a factor lambda to the d, where the d is the dimension. So this prefactor must be something that has a power of d, of the scaling of the individual ones. Now, if you think about an object, a natural object that could have this property, then one candidate is actually the determinant of the metric. And this turns out to be the right choice. And I will just now claim it, and then we will, of course, prove that it's indeed a correct choice. So generally, so general definition. So this was just for normal coordinates. And now we go to the general definition in arbitrary coordinates. is the following. So it's almost the same as the one I had in normal coordinates, except of course there is now a prefactor and this prefactor is the determinant of the metric G, which is usually denoted by this and it actually is the absolute value of the determinant of the metric and the rest is the same as before. Now what, what is the determinant of the metric really? So let me also write this formally. So the determinant of the metric or this symbol is usually used to um, denote what you are maybe more used to as being denoted like this. So this square bracket I now take to be a bracket which turns something into a matrix. So I'm just using that to make the connection to something you already know from linear algebra. There would be no need in general relativity to ever talk about matrices. But because you know the concept of a determinant already from linear algebra, let me just use this bracket to say this means the matrix whose components are the elements G, I, J. So it's a D, I, T, T times D matrix. And then you know what the determinant means. Of course, I could also express, and, and by the way, it's, it also, we're always interested in the absolute value, just to make clear, I can, of course, write this without returning to linear algebra notions. And the way to do it is just to use this so-called Levi-Civita symbol, which um, I'll just define if for the case you haven't already seen it. And then I multiply this with the metric n time or d times. So I take the symbol here and then I have g1 I1 and so on until G D I D. And I take the absolute value. And as I said, this Levi Civita symbol is something that you may already have heard of. It's just defined as something that is equal to the signature of the permutation that you need to apply 
in order to get the sequence of indices. So you have the sequence of indices, I1 up to ID. And the question is how permuted are they, are they if you start just with the indices ordered from 1 to D? And of course, it's not always possible to just obtain the indices from permuting 1 to D, namely if two indices are equal or more indices are equal. And in all these cases, this symbol is just zero. And that's exactly what you do if you actually calculate the determinant. Now, think of this expression here. So this expression really means you take the product of the first, the entry of the matrix in the first row with the I1 column and so on, up to the D row with the ID column, where I1 to ID are any permutations. So you go through all these permutations and multiply with an appropriate sign. This Levi Civita symbol gives you the sign. Okay, now there's an interesting. Um, oh, no, maybe let's first actually do our job right. And what does it mean to do our job right whenever I state the definition in coordinates? And this obviously is a coordinate dependent definition. I have to prove somewhere, and I will do that, that this expression is actually at the end independent of coordinates. So if I use different coordinates, this would not give me a different um, form. So let's do that. I think this is just something that is necessary to be done. So we prove now the coordinate independence of the definition. So just to make clear what we are now doing. So the left-hand side should be something that is independent of the coordinates, but the right-hand side looks as if it depends on coordinates, but it will actually not, as we are now going to show. In order to do that, it's useful to note or remember one property that the determinant has. So let's suppose we take the determinant of the metric in different coordinates. So again, we have two coordinate systems, one with and one without the tilde. And now I could ask myself, this will be useful for our calculation, what's the determinant of this metric G tilde if I express the G tilde in terms of G? So what's the basis transformation that I need to apply to express G tilde in terms of G? That's something you should by now know quite well. So I have to multiply with these partial derivatives of, of these um, of the chart transformation map. Let me put here um, to put here two new summation indices, i and j, and then I have to sum that and multiply multiplied with g i j. So so far I just used the coordinate transformation and how it applies to the metric, and now I use a fact that you should know from linear algebra, namely that if I have a determinant of products of matrices, and after all, this is just a product of, of three matrices. I mean, you could think of this as, yeah. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll have to, let me write this more explicitly. So one, the first term is this. And now if I write a term like this as a matrix, I should tell you which part is the column index and which, part, which one is the row index. Let's assume, um, yeah, I think it doesn't matter so much. Uh, yeah, let's assume that the first one is the row index and the second one the column. Let's just take that as a convention. I mean, we have to introduce some convention if we, if we transform these objects into matrices. And then I could have if I now want the summation with to see look like a matrix multiplication, I need to take the transpose. Because of course, if I sum or if I multiply two matrices, I'm taking actually the column vector of the first one over which I sum. But I don't want to sum over M, I want to sum over I. That's why I put the transpose here. But here for the second one, it works. So here, I don't need to do the transpose. I just 
can write this. Of course, I use here the same convention. The upper index, the first one, J, is the row, and the second one is the column. So now I've written this as a multiplication of matrices, and now comes the knowledge you should have from linear algebra, namely that the determinant of a product of matrices is equal to the product of the determinants of these matrices. So I can just write this in this form here. And I'll write the two um, partial or the two coordinate transformation matrices first. One was transposed, but you should also know from linear algebra that the determinant of the transpose matrix is equal to the determinant of the matrix itself. And so I'll get this expression. So these two are essentially the same. I just use different indices. So the determinant is the same of these two, which means the whole thing is just a determinant squared. And if I take at the end um, square root, it will be the absolute value. But let's leave that for the moment. We will use it in a minute. So let's now suppose that I, I defined um, the volume form in terms of another coordinate system of the tilde coordinate system using the definition we stated. So I'll, I'll just do, do everything as stated, but I put tildes everywhere. Now I want to verify that this is equal to the previous definition. Obviously, I use now what we just did. So here you see it's the square root of the determinant. And we have just calculated that the square root of the determinant of the G tilde matrix is actually equal to the determinant of the G matrix with these prefactors. And these are the same. And I take the square root. So the, this is just once the determinant of that. So I can write this as G determinant times absolute value of the determinant of this transformation matrix, of the Jacobi matrix of the chart transformation, which is this one here. And then I still have, I haven't touched the other, these basis vectors. So the, these are still tilde vectors. So far, I just replaced the expression for the determinant. Okay, now I think we have to use something else. So what is this something else? So remember that this thing here, this blue underlined part is essentially the coefficient of the volume form G um, with indices one to D. I mean, that's just what it means to be um, a prefactor in front of these basis vectors. It's a coefficient. And we already know how coefficients of, G this is just a form. So it's a particular form we defined, but we already showed last time how the coefficients of a D form transforms if I go to other coordinates. So let's look this up for the moment. For a moment, I think it was last lecture. Let me just see whether I can find it somewhere. Um, Yeah, I think it was here, exactly. You can see it now. See, we, we have already shown that if you have a form expressed in tilde coordinates, then it's equal to the form in non-tilde coordinates times a determinant. So let me just copy that expression here. Okay, so let's go back. So what we, we have seen there is the following, that this is equal to this times the determinant of um, dxi to the dx tilde m. Now, if you compare this, so if you look at this and this, then what you find is that the prefactor, so that this part here, the square root of the determinant of G has to be equal to that. But that's the prefactor that we ha would have if we put here the non-tilde basis vectors. So we can conclude from this that we could equally well write this 
times the norm tilde basis vectors, dxd. And now we are done because that's exactly the expression that we had originally, which we took as a definition. So we therefore showed that if we take a definition and express everything in the tilde basis, we get essentially everything back in the original basis. You know, the trick here was, I mean, trick or the, the point is that you see the, the role that this prefactor plays. We know that a volume for, or a channel form, if you go to another coordinate, has, will pick up this additional factor here. Now we have to somehow compensate for that. If we, if we didn't put this determinant, we would just have picked up this factor. So if I put here one instead, I would be left with the determinant of this um, map, with this thing here, which would be bad because it would tell me that the whole, um, the whole definition is not basis independent. So this, this square root of the determinant has the effect that it essentially cancels that so that the definition becomes basis independent or coordinate independent. Um, just um, some people are um, worried about how, how you wrote um, things just before. Mm -hmm. when you took the transpose of, I guess, the matrix element instead of the matrix. Aha, uh -huh, yes. OK. So was there a specific question or is just was it unclear? Um, there's a whole discussion. I'm not sure. So, the, the, the I think the worry is that um, um, yes, if, I guess if you take the transpose of the of this element, like with the indices. Okay, let's try to figure out whether everything is correct. Maybe I confused indices because usually if there's a discussion in the chat, this is a bad sign for me. It usually means I made a mistake. So let's figure it out. So, okay. Let me just write down the matrix here. So let's um, look at this green thing here without the transpose and write it as a matrix. So what would it mean? So when I say that, that the I thing is the row, then it means that I have, for example, here the entry D to DX1. Okay, here it doesn't matter. It's DX1 to the DX tilde one. And then the next entry will be DX2 to the dx tilde one and so on. So let me just assume the dimension is two because I think for the order of indices that's sufficient. And then we would have here still dx one to dx tilde two and here dx two to dx tilde two. So that is the matrix as it is defined. Now the transpose of that is of course the one where I just exchange the two diagonal, no off diagonal elements um, so, which means now that, um, yeah, if I, let's see what, what happens. So if I now look at the matrix multiplication, then I'll, um, okay, I have not really enough space here. Let me, yeah, let me use that space here. So. So the just the first line, let's make this quick, but the first line of the of the transpose matrix, um, this transposed would now look like dx1 to dx tilde one and then dx2 to dx tilde one. And here I have something more. And then the, the G matrix would look like this G1 one and then maybe here g one two g uh, so, sorry this would be g two one and then g one two g two two so it would indeed yes i think it's it should be correct because you see now if i multiply i get indeed this upper index here that is summed over with this first index of g so i will have this element combined with this which is exactly what I want because I want this I to be summed with this thing here. Or Jan, do you see any problem there? Maybe I'm missing something or maybe the question was about something else. Yeah, let me for the moment leave it with that here and please feel free to ask later. But that's essentially what I meant by the square that and you can write things like this.
Okay, keep it here on the right hand side so that you can still think about that for a moment and, and then ask later if something was still unclear. Um, I would, just to finish this little mathematical section, I want to do one more thing. Namely, I would like to talk about the notion of a divergence. So, you know, we, um, you know the notion of a divergence of, the ve of a vector field already from maybe analysis or electrodynamics. And it's actually a notion that is also quite useful in general relativity, but it becomes a bit more involved because we are now obviously in curved space time. And maybe more generally, I mean, if you're asking what, what are we actually doing? I already gave you some motivation earlier when, we said, when I said that we want to talk about charge and density, but more generally you could think of um, of it in the following way. So suppose you want to do electrodynamics and you already know how electrodynamics works and it has objects like um, electric fields and uh, magnetic fields. And then the Maxwell equations involve objects like taking um, gradients or rotation and divergences and so on. Then the question is, how does this all look like on curved space time? So if, the, if space time is now um, general um, space time as we consider it in GR, how does now an electromagnetic field behave on that space time? And again, the guidance here is to say that everything should essentially look as it usually does in normal coordinates. So if you are in a flat enough small region, but it should still be, they should all be valid tensors. And in particular, all these derivatives that we usually take, so the divergence and so on should be valid things in the sense that they take such a vector field and make again out of it, for example, a vector field, not something that is coordinate dependent. So a vector field is something that is not, that is defined independently of coordinates. And the divergence is one of these things that enter. So the question is, how should we think of the divergence? And actually the way of thinking about it is a priori or at first sight quite different from the way you think about it in analysis or electrodynamics. But you will see that it's really the same notion. It's just represented in a quite different way. So maybe to, to give you some intuition about that, let's um, again remember what you're often doing in electrodynamics. So in electrodynamics, you often have, for example, a surface, um, which could be um, something like this blue thing. And then you have a tangent plane to this surface and you say you characterize the tangent plane by a vector that is orthogonal to the surface. So let me now assume you are in three space, so I put vector arrows here. Now you could have another vector. So for example, you could have a vector, um, an electric field. But let's just generally think of a vector which I call set. But as an example, it could be an electric field. And then you may ask, how much of this field, um, you, I mean, or maybe you know from electronics that you often integrate over a surface and then you take the integral over the scalar product between the normal of the to the surface, the vector S with the electric field, which in this example would be set. And that's something that we want to somehow generalize. So this idea that we, we are, for example, integrating over something or we characterize somehow a surface in terms of a vector and so on. So all these notions will now play a role. So this picture will be useful. So another thing that you're probably familiar with is that we can always characterize a vector by its dual vector in the sense that um, we just take the scalar. So if, if this is a given vector, if I tell you what the scalar product is between this vector and any other possible vector, then this defines that vector. And that's of course just the, the dual vector that you already know of or, or the vector we obtain by applying the raising operator. That's an object that takes a, another vector and tells you what's the scalar product with the original one. And in some way we can do that in higher dimensions where one thing is not a vector, but a whole hyperplane. And that will lead us to this notion of, um, of divergence ultimately. So let's start again with a manifold now. So this was just a picture to illustrate 
or to give you the right, um, let's say, feeling what this is all about. Let's suppose that we have, again, a manifold with a volume form, which should be this um, volume form induced by a metric, but I will not always write the G. So this is just a volume form. And let's suppose we have a vector field set. So now a channel vector field has no vector arrow on top of it. That's um, something we just um, look at more generally. And now I'll define something new. I define a yotta set omega, which is a new thing. This is the D minus one form defined as follows. So it's a D minus one form, which um, as I said, is denoted by yotta set omega. And as a D minus one form, it obviously takes D minus one vectors as input and gives out the number. What's the number that it tells you, uh, that it gives you? It gives you the number which is obtained by taking the vector set of the vector field and just all the other vectors that are given as input to this new object and it calculates the volume. So here maybe the, the picture, let me just draw a new picture, but it's almost equivalent to the above one. So let's suppose you have vectors V1 to Vd. So I'll assume that D is just two in, or V1 to Vd minus one. So let's assume D is three. So I have two such vectors. And let's suppose the vector field set is, um, has at a certain point um, looks like this. Now, what does this thing here do? I mean, that we already understand. This it just means it's the volume of the cube or the cuboid that is spanned by these vectors. So in, in some way, we are just defining, um, we are using the idea that it could be a cuboid with, okay, I think it's roughly like this. So it's the one that is spanned by these vectors and it has a volume and we are somehow saying of, we could express, so the vector set here may be characterized as follows. So instead of telling you what is the vector set, I could tell you the answer to that question for every V. So the Vs somehow span a plane. So I could say, in, um, the vector is characterized by the fact that I tell you for any possible plane, for any of these orange planes, what is the volume that is spanned if I take this plane and the vector I want to talk about. And that gives kind of um, this thing. So another way of thinking about this is to relate it to this. I could say that if, I, if I'm interested I mean, here I'm often interested in the scalar product between set and the orthogonal to the plane, set and this. And what does set, what does the scalar product between set and this mean geometrically? Actually, what it means is really, it's the volume exactly of the cuboid that will be spanned by taking this little um, plane here, this tangent plane and um, multiplying or and taking this axis as the, as the third dimension. So it's in some way, therefore you could see that as the analog, and we'll just put that in a different color to make it, this is just somehow an analogy. It corresponds to in the upper picture to say, we just take set vector times S vector. And this is something you, you are quite familiar with. As I said, I mean, you, you often do that in electrodynamics. And this is now just a generalized way of saying that. But instead of characterizing the surface or the, the plane in terms of a vector, we characterize it in terms of its spanning vectors. Okay, this was more a geometric intuition and maybe it's most useful if you now just um, follow the development that I will give and then maybe return to that geometric picture and try to see whether you now understand what I told you.
So now we, we finally come to the definition of the divergence. So remember that if I apply this yotta operation, yotta set to omega, and omega was a d form, then the new thing is a d minus one form. But now if I took the exterior derivative of the whole thing, this would again be a d form. So this is a, this is a d form. That sounds a bit complicated in a way, but think of this just as another representation of the vector set. So instead of representing the vector set as a vector, I now represent it in terms of a d minus one form. And actually, if you think about this, this is um, not unnatural because a d minus one form has um, d independent coordinates. Um, I mean, you can easily see that from the anti-symmetrization property. It's just essentially d minus one indices. And how many ways are there to put d minus one different indices if each index can only range from one to d? They're exactly d many. And so therefore the dimension of this object, so the dimension of this d minus one form is equal to the dimension of the original vector. So this is really just a different way to rep represent the vector. Somehow a way to represent the vector that is suitable if you think of it as defining planes in some way. And now we take, so if you think in that way, then this d is somehow an operation that takes a vector as an input and makes a new object out of it. But this new object is a d form, but the d form has only one degree of freedom. So this object is something that is defined by just one degree of freedom. And because a d form um, is always, um, I mean, because it has only one um, degree of freedom, it's always proportional to any other d form. So we can say that this object that I just wrote down has to be somehow proportional to any other d form. And for example, the original omega is of course also a d form. So it has to be proportional to that. And now we define, so we define the divergence of the vector field set by requiring that it's the proportionality factor in between the two. So we just say the divergence of the vector field set is defined as the number I need to put here in order to make this a valid equation. So on the left hand I have a d form, on the right hand I have a d form, but um, there's a factor in between the two and this is the divergence. Okay, this sounds like a big detour but let's now check whether it indeed boils down at least in three dimensions to what you know as the divergence. And this is actually quite easy to do. So let's do it. I mean, of course, I don't want to only do easy things, but um, it's certainly that's something very nice. And so what we do is let's apply Stokes theorem to, that, to this divergence that we just defined. So what does this mean? So let's suppose we have a manifold and think if you want, you can now think of three dimensional space because then you will immediately, immediately see this relation to the divergence. So you would be a region in three dimensional space, a three dimensional region in three dimensional space. And we could now integrate over it. So one thing we could do is to integrate over um, let's take now a vector field again, vector field set. Oh, let me now take to make this, no, I think you can do this analogy. I mean, I wanted to take the electric field. Just think of set, for example, as the electric field. So write an E instead of set, if you like. By the way, this expression would not be defined well because I cannot integrate over a real number. So this is just a scalar and it's not defined what it means to integrate on a manifold over a scalar. I told you that already, but it's well defined to integrate over a form. And of course, if I multiply a scalar with a form, I get again a form. That was the whole point of, of this equation. So this is a well-defined integral. Now in our analogy, um, to three-dimensional geometry, you should interpret this 
as the integral over just the normal divergence of a vector. Like if I put vector arrows, that just means that's all what you know from electrodynamics. And of course, the expressions are really, I mean, um, now different because here you would have to integrate over du or something. So that's a, an analogy in the sense, I mean, it's more than an analogy. You could say the special case of this expression if you go to three dimensional um, space and use the usual rules of integration, you could write it as this. And of course, what you want at the end is that this special case is exactly the case we already understood earlier. Now, by definition, by the very definition of, of our divergence, this is just equal to d yota set omega. That's exactly how we define the whole thing. But now I have a d, an exterior derivative applied to something, to a, uh, um, and this has to be a d minus one form. So I could just apply Stokes theorem and say this must be equal to an integration over the boundary of, of my domain, of my region, of the thing that was inside the exterior derivative, which is this thing here, I set omega. Now, this object will, and I will explain that, correspond to what you're used to. You're, of course, used to integrating over the boundary of a region, so we can do that. And this object really corresponds now to this thing here. Actually, maybe I don't now have to explain that any longer because that was exactly the analogy from the beginning. I told you here already that yota, yota set omega means just the scalar product be between the normal vector to the surface. And that's what I mean by this thing. That's the usual expression. So that's just this S. Is the normal of the, the normal to the infinitesimal element on the surface times set where times means near here the ordinary scalar product in three dimension or the inner product in three dimension. So, in other words, we understand now that this thing, in the special case of three dimensional geometry, reduces to this well known expression. This thing reduces to that. We have a ge very general theorem, Stokes theorem, which tells us the two are equal. And this, of course, implies that this is equal to that. And that's something that you know as Gauss's theorem. If you, again, replace set by an electromagnetic field or by the electric field, then this is really what you probably have done very often to say that the divergence of the electric field over a region is equal, um, as, is equal to um, the, the flow of the field through the boundary and the integrated flow of the field through the boundary, which is this, which makes sense because remember the divergence of the electric field is the charge. And so um, this is somehow, um, of course, um, the usual Coulomb law, it will reduce to at the end. Okay. But why did, you, did we do all this effort of writing it in that way? As I said, these are all well-defined things now. These are well-defined objects we can on a manifold. And that's not the case, for example, for this. We don't know what this scalar product means here. What is this ds and so on? I mean, now we know it. It's exactly what, what we had in our generalization. Now there's another analogy or analogy, another, um, let's say, correspondence to stuff you already know. In the exercises, you will namely show that the divergence of set, which is always a number, as I said before, could also be written equivalently as taking um, the covariant derivatives of set and summing over the components i. Now there's something that could be confusing that I pointed out earlier. This expression here doesn't mean that you take the i's component and then the derivative to the i's. What it means is the following. It means more precisely that you take the derivative in the i's direction, the covariant derivative in the i's direction of the vector set. And then once you have taken the derivative of the vector, not of the component, of the vector, you take the i's component out. And then you sum over the i's. So that's what this means. 
And that, as I said, that's part of the exercises. Now you may um, wonder, I mean, in electrodynamics, maybe in analysis, you have seen other things than divergence. You have seen gradient and so on. And before I end for today, and this will also be the end of this whole mathematical interlude, we will then return next week to general relativity on real space time. I wanted to give you um, kind of a very small, it's a, maybe a table or an overview that makes this correspondence clear. So in three space, we have the following relations. So let's suppose you have a zero form. The zero form is usually denoted by an F. Now, if you take df, that's a one form, as you know. And what does this one form correspond to in usual three-dimensional geometry? Actually, what it does, and I'm here just telling you that, and then I think it's easy to verify this by just going into normal coordinates and, and actually calculating things. But you, what you will see, this is what you're usually used to as the gradient of a function. Now, actually, this may be surprising because you know well that, I mean, or what you learned, this is maybe not what you should know, but what you learned is that the gradient of a function is a vector. What this more general treatment that we have in curved space time tells you is that it's much better to think of the gradient not as a vector, but of a covector or a one form. And of course, the two are related. We could, in principle, if you really see a gradient as a vector, we could turn it into a covector by doing, by applying this lowering operator that we studied some time ago. And this is how the two are related. Or conversely, we can, of course, apply the raising operator to go back to this view where gradient is a vector. But in, in the context of GR and curve space time, really, I think it's recommendable to think of the gradient always in this way and not do this transition in two vectors, just think of it as a covector. So what covector? So why do I say that? So the gradient is really something extremely intuitive. The gradient is something that, for example, I mean, let's again take the Earth's surface. And there I have the altitude of, of hills and mountains and so on. What is, how is the gradient defined? The gradient is now in general relativity an object that takes as input the vector. So that's maybe strange. You would say, okay, the gradient should be a vector. No, it's an object that takes as input the vector and gives me a number back. So what is the geometric meaning of that? The geometric meaning is the following. Let's suppose I walk on the Earth's surface, which has these different altitude levels. And then I, I could ask my question, if I walk by, let's say, in, this, in the direction of this vector, of this, white vectors that you see on the screen, how much does my altitude change? And that's exactly what, what the, the one form DF does. The one form takes as input that vector in which I want to walk and tells me how much my altitude changed. So in that sense, it, it's extremely natural. A gradient is a device that tells you how much you have to work or how much you have to, to, to go up in order to, to go one into a certain direction that you can freely specify as an input. I'm sorry, this yes. is just a request to scroll down on the... Yes, that's... Let me just before ending, finish that small table and also put the one form. There will not be um, that... Um, or go into that level of detail as before, but just complete this thing. So if you have a one form, you may, for example, think of the one form actually as, um, I mean, a one form, as we just said, could, could also be represented as a vector. And in electrodynamics, for example, the B field could be something that if you lower it with this lowering operator could be expressed by a one form. And the D omega is then, of course, a two form. And the point is that this is what usually corresponds to the rotation of, for example, this B vector. So again, here, the rotation, you are used to the rotation as being again a vector. But actually, in the case of rotation, it's much more useful to think of it as a two form, 
And the two are indeed related. And the way they are related is exactly now via this Yotta operation that we have seen. So the Yotta operation somehow makes a relation between a vector, seen as a vector, and seen as the plane orthogonal to that vector. And a two form is something that characterizes a plane. And so in a sense, it's what this thing tells you is that you should somehow regard the rotation as something that is like more like a plane. And indeed, if you go to higher dimensions, it's no longer true that a plane can be characterized by one vector. So this is just a coincidence of three-dimensional geometry that a plane is characterized by the same number of components as a vector if it's a two-dimensional plane. And I mean, two-dimensional plane in three dimensions is itself characterized by three components, but a two-dimensional plane in four dimensions, um, that would be different there. And however, in three dimensions, we think of this as a vector, but we can relate it to this two form in this way. And then finally, if I look at a two form, which is the highest form that makes sense um, in three dimensions, because um, if I want to take the exterior derivative, then I get a three form here. And what does this three form correspond to? Um, that's what we just saw. This corresponds to the divergence. So that's something you could interpret as, for example, the divergence of an E field. If you think of the two form as an E field, so let's suppose you already have an E field. And now in the same way, as I explained before, you could take this Yotta operation to represent the E field as a two form. And if you now take the exterior derivative of the two form, you get a three form and this three form corresponds to what you call usually the divergence. And of course it's a form. So you have to multiply it with omega to turn the divergence into a form. Okay, just to be clear, I, I didn't prove any of these things now. I just told you what they are, but they are very easy to verify and I encourage you to do that. Just take one of them and evaluate the things. I mean, here, this is defined in terms of a rule. How do you calculate the rotation? You take these particular derivatives, do the same for this and you will find that it's indeed the same thing. And okay, so I think what this all tells you is that we can reproduce all these objects that are relevant to electrodynamics by one single quite easily defined object. So remember this D, the series derivative, maybe it takes some time to get used to it, but once you understand it, it's just one thing that encompasses all these different notions that you have learned before. And there's also one, only one theorem. There's not Gauss theorem and Stokes theorem. There's only Stokes theorem that is always the same theorem. And it has all these theorems that you learned in electrodynamics as special cases that you can also verify if you want. Of course, that's not part of this lecture, but you can now in principle go there and reproduce all you did in electrodynamics from these um, more general statements. And that's not just the luxury to do that. We need to do it because we are in curved space time, of course, but it has the benefit of at the same time as it generalizes things, also making things much more elegant, which is, I think, very nice. Okay, so with that, I think we have really concluded this mathematical part. I hope to, to see you again next week for a more physics-like lecture. <laughs>